Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, one of America's clowns, Red Skelton. something to be here. I'd like to thank you, uh, Your Royal Highness, Lords, Ladies and, and Mrs. Skelton. <laughs> the, uh, it's nice to be back in London again. I'm actually here by popular demand. I was here in 1949. <laughs> but it's a beautiful city if you ever get it finished. I mean, <laughs> when I first came down to the main part of town, I said, were there any survivors? I think the national bird must be the crane. There's one on every building in town, you know? <laughs> but uh, like I say, it's nice to be, I don't usually just walk out like this. I usually have 15 elephants that come out before me. But did you ever see elephants walk down the street? They take their trunk and wrap around the tail in front of them. See, they go down. We were playing in Shreveport, Louisiana, and they had to cross the railroad track to get over to the theater. And a train came along, killed the first one, ripped the tails out of the little 14. <laughs> I'm lying. <laughs> we, uh, I, I flew to London. We flew over on that, um, that Concorde. <laughs> that, that, that's something else, you know. They, they, and, and it affects your ears, you know. When you land, they, they give you chewing gum. I'll never do that again. It took me three days to get that stuff out of my ears, you know. <laughs> We're flying 35,000 feet in the air, and they start serving drinks right down the aisle. I said to a little priest next to me, you going to have a drink, Father? He said, oh, no, too close to the main office. <laughs> and I got in trouble. I got in trouble going through customs. I got in trouble. His father said, you have anything to declare? I said, nothing. He said, what have you got under your arm? I said, hair where you got feathers? <laughs> you know, when you come from Ireland, they won't let you bring Irish whiskey in. See, I wanted a little bottle as a souvenir. So uh, they were going through, and he says, what's in the bottle? I says, holy water. <laughs> he takes off the cork, he smells it, he says, Irish whiskey. I says, good heavens, another miracle. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun being here. And of course, at my age, it's a lot of fun to be anywhere, you know. <laughs> you know how you tell when you're getting old is when your, your, your broad mind changes places with your narrow waist. <laughs> no, I, you know, talking about age, I don't let age bother me. I'm only hanging around long enough to see who gets Brooke Shields, you know? <laughs> but uh, talking about health and stuff, I, I really feel good. I feel good. I found a great way to start the day. You go back to bed. <laughs> but every afternoon I have aerobic naps. <laughs> hey, you want to do something? When your neighbors are watching you out in the backyard, you want them to make them think you're doing aerobics, you know, you put your hands back, back like this, see, and you get a good hold, and you stand there like this. <laughs> I play a lot of senior citizen places and concerts, also colleges. I play a lot of colleges and conventions. There's one place in, in, in the States called Sun City. It's in Arizona. <laughs> And these people there, they, now I'm old, I'm old. <laughs> they refer to me as Sonny. <laughs> this one little lady, I says, how old are you? She said, 84. I said, what do you do for excitement? She said, oh, we date, we date. <laughs> I had a date last night with a fellow that was 91. The rascal, <laughs> I slapped him three times. <laughs> I said, he got fresh? She says, no, no, I want to see if he was still alive. <laughs> But great wisdom comes with age, great wisdom. This little guy, 85 years old, he says to his friend, I'm getting married. He says, yeah, who are you going to marry? He says, that little waitress down the street, she's only 20. He says, you're 85, you're going to marry a girl 20? Boy, that could be sudden death. He says, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> I thought one little fella, he says, I'm going to the, um, 
to the uh, hang glider school. Been going there for about three months now. I said, how many successful jumps do you have to make before you graduate? He says, all of them. <laughs> but did you ever see elderly people, things that they do, like when they take out their teeth, they look like they're eating their nose. <laughs> and they stand together, they look like parentheses. I saw this one little lady down there in Arizona, she was so bold-legged. <laughs> she runs, she'd look like an egg beater. <laughs> she said she got her bold legs from hitchhiking rides on oil trucks. <laughs> <laughs> they, were <st> <laughs> they were standing there talking, one of them says, uh, it's dull around here, isn't it? She says, it certainly is. She says, what can we do for some excitement? She says, I don't know. Let's strip off and run right down Main Street. So they did. They run. <laughs> See, I know what's coming. <laughs> they run down the main street. They pass two officers in a squad car, and they watch them go by. One of them says, "Wasn't that the Elviry sisters that just went by?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "What the hell were they wearing?" <laughs> the, other, <laughs> the other one says, "I don't know, but they ought to get it pressed." <laughs> I tell you, they get those wrinkles ironed out, they'd be nine feet tall, you know? <laughs> but you know, everybody should really be happy in everything they do. Because uh, you never, nowadays, you never know when you're well off. There was a big flood in, in, in uh, Louisiana, uh, back in the States. And this guy's standing in water up to his knees, and they came behind a rowboat and says, get in. He says, oh no, the Lord will take care of me. A few minutes later, he's up on the porch and the water's up to his waist. Another robo comes by, he says, get in. He says, oh no, the Lord will take care of me. Now he's on the roof and the water's up to his neck. A helicopter comes by and he says, no, no, the Lord will take care of me. Well, he drowns, see. He gets up to heaven, he meets the Lord. He says, the Lord, what happened? Lord says, I don't know what happened. I sent two robots and a helicopter for you. <laughs> I like nutty things that happen. I went into a little pub and I said to the bartender, I said, Have you got anything for the hiccups? He says, I certainly have. He grabs a wet bar towel, he starts smacking me, see? And he squirts me with shells and I start smacking me again. He says, Now you got the hiccups? I said, I never did have them. It's from a wife out in the car. <laughs> I got a joke for you. Would you bring, bring me my hat? Would you, would you bring my hat? New here, huh? You ain't gonna be old. <laughs> I got a joke for you. Now I write, a, I write a lot of children's books, and two of my characters that uh, are quite famous is Gertrude and Heathcliff, the two seagulls. The, oh, thank you very much, both of you. They're flying. She said, "Did you hear what happened to Willie the duck?" He says, "No." That's the way they talk. No. What happened to Willie the duck? Said he flew upside down, and quacked up. <laughs> They were waiting for their friend, the sparrow. The little sparrow comes in, he doesn't have a feather on him. Doesn't have a feather. Comes in walking people toad. <laughs> <laughs> They're waiting for this little sparrow, and the sparrow comes in, he doesn't have a feather on him, he's all beaten up. He says, what happened? He says, oh, you'll never believe it. I was flying too low over London, and I got in the damnedest badminton game you ever saw. If you know any of these jokes, just go join in. <laughs> I, I have another character that I do that's called Clem Cadiddlehopper, you know. He's sort of a half-wit idiot thing, you know. And uh, I was invited to the White House when Carter was in office, and I did Clem Cadiddlehopper, and he took it personal. <laughs> and I met Billy Carter, oh boy. <laughs> He's one peanut short of a full bag too, you know. He heard he's back, he came running downstairs at the White House and he slipped and fell, he kept forgetting his chain didn't reach the main floor. <laughs> now that's the extent of the political jokes. Although I'll tell you one thing, I think Reagan is for uh, that marijuana stuff. I heard just tonight on the air he's going to have a joint session with Congress. <laughs> Knowing that this was for the Audubon Society, I have written a little song and um, I'll sing it through, 
It's not, it's not going to hit the charts or anything, but uh, it's a, a little, little song. If I were the king of the birdies, what a change in this world there'd be. If I were the king of the birdies, I'd give birds some dignity. I'd build thousands and thousands of bird baths, fresh soaps and towels every day, with hundreds and hundreds of bird dogs to chase the cats away. I'd give all of the birdies a nest egg, clear skies to fly without grief. See, they were fed three times a day with worms on every leaf. If I were the king of the birdies, I would teach equality. If I were the king of the birdies, no human would stand beneath me. Go free. I'm gonna go free. Two little Italians are talking. One of them says, you know what's so wrong with us? We drink too much wine. He says, okay, we don't drink no more. He says, no, no, wait a minute. What we should do, take one little bottle, put it up on a shelf just in case somebody gets sick. He said, that's a good idea. A couple of days later, his friend comes over and he says, I don't feel too good. <laughs> he says, you're too late. I was sick all day yesterday. <laughs> we were just over in Italy. We were just, I met Sophia Lauren. <laughs> There's a Roman that wasn't built in a day, boy. Uh, yeah, the, um, oh, did you read in the paper where they're going to put a clock in the leaning tower? That hit me funny. I don't have any joke for it, but I just... <laughs> leaning tower, well, I guess you know how the Italians are. Why have an inclination if you don't have the time? That's about the best thing you can do. <laughs> what I like to do now, a little, a little mime, where I play two parts. I play the fisherman and the little boy. Now the story is, this fellow's gone out and spent all his money to buy the finest fishing equipment in the world, but he doesn't catch anything. There's a little boy on the pier with a string, a safety pin, and a uh, can of worms. He catches everything. This is called a pescatore el ragazzo, a fisherman and a little boy. <laughs>
Poem. I mean, a poem. My next, <laughs> next is an idiot putting his coat on. Mom! Here, next little pantomime. Little old man playing golf. Little old man playing golf. I bet you think I'm kidding. <laughs> this is when I'm kidding. <laughs> Do you ever have things bother you and you can't get them off your mind? It just came to me now. People in hell, where do they tell people to go? No, another thing bothers me. <laughs> Why do they have a disabled parking space in front of a pub? <laughs> you know what else bothers me? <laughs> How can your wife see a little blonde hair on your coat and miss the garage door? <laughs> another one. <laughs> Do you ever have a girl say, take my heart? Eh? What the hell are you going to do with anything going like that? <laughs> Another one. How can a little kid, 10 years old, find a dope pusher in Scotland Yard camp? <laughs> little old man playing golf. I'm nuts, he's pointing out where the club was.
Thank you. My next little, these pants, when you perspire, the longer you wear them, the longer they get. I think, let me fix it. I got news for you. Those cross your hearts do not work. <laughs> that goes to that no nonsense stuff too. <laughs> the uh, people walk up and they say, now that you're not in movies and on television as much, how do you occupy your time? I have quite a busy day. I do about 125 concerts a year and plus two specials for home box office and a motion picture. I play a lot of colleges and uh, I write music, all the music you hear played while I'm out here. I composed, but I'd like for you to meet my conductor, Mr. Jerry Kay. Jerry? Yeah. I write music, write short stories. I love to play conventions, though. I, uh, I love to hear people make speeches. I was invited to the United Nations and I was seated next to an oriental gentleman. Now, obviously, I don't speak the oriental tongue, <laughs> but you know how uh, most people are. They think if somebody has an accent or a dialect, if you join them, you're helping them. You know? I turned to this fellow and I said, uh, you likey building? <laughs> he didn't say anything. <laughs> they serve the food and I said, you likey steaky? <laughs> he didn't say anything. They introduced this gentleman. He got up and he says, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Never before in my vivid career have I ever witnessed such a demonstration of generosity which has greeted me here in America. When I return to my homeland, I shall tell my people of your hospitality. I am most certain to help cement relationships between our nations, and I thank you. He sat down, he turned to me, and he said, you like his speechy? I saw, I saw a fellow make a speech once and I felt sorry for him because I knew what had happened. He had written his speech, put it on the hall table, went upstairs to change clothes. Meanwhile, his little boy came home from school. And the little boy had been naughty in school that day and they made him write the alphabet 100 times. <laughs> well, the little kid came home from school and he puts his schoolwork up on the table. He goes on about his business. Now the old boy comes downstairs. He picks up what he thinks is his speech. <laughs> but it's the alphabet. Uh, he's one of these guys who has to read everything, see. He couldn't memorize the speech. He couldn't ad lib a burp at a Hungarian dinner, you know? <laughs> I'll show you what happened to this poor sucker. Give him a seat here. Thank you very much. You're very nice. You're going a long way. And you better start now or it's going to be dark when you get there. <laughs> Did you ever notice people when they make... make <laughs> You want to see the dirty things they write me. I, I, I don't care. I put it in my pocket and let the girl at the cleaning office faint again tomorrow. <laughs> you ever notice people when they make speeches, the first speaker has trouble with microphones. These guys, <clears throat> we ready to start? Is this thing on? Can you folks hear all right out there? Testing, one, two. It's on. A little wet, but it's on. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I just... Is this on? Could you turn it up a little? I don't think it's loud enough. Turn it up just a little bit. Hold it, hold it! Hold it, you idiot! I didn't get all that gum out. Just blew a hernia, or whatever that is up there. <laughs> you ever see, hear these fellows when they're making a speech and the microphones go dead? Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'd like to meet a man who's been in your community for... What's the matter with a damn thing? We <laughs> We'd like... <laughs> what 
probably shove it in an ash can. <laughs> We'd like to meet a man who's been in your community for a good many years. <laughs> this man is honest. This man is sincere. This man is... <laughs> Here comes the plane, boss. Don't you love it when someone's trying to be serious and everything goes wrong, huh? I got one for you. I got one for you. <laughs> A little Chinaman ironing clothes. Ah, oh, so at the hotel side and side. Oh, hot iron, hot iron. Oh. <laughs> ding a ling a ling telephone. Hello. Ha <laughs> ha. We like to meet a young man that doesn't know that he has his little boy's schoolwork, his ABCs. We get, we get, ladies, I got a frog in my throat, and I think he brought the whole family. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. J.K. L. M. N. O. P. Q. R. S. T. U. V. W. X. Y. Z. A. B. C. <laughs> and in conclusion, may I remind you of the big ball game on Sunday? The Knights of Columbus will play the Ku Klux Klan for the benefit of the Jewish Relief Fund. I mean, due to the fact that Monday comes on Tuesday this Wednesday, our regular Thursday meeting will be held on Friday this Saturday because Sunday is a holiday. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Are you getting tired? Are you getting tired? Okay. It's warm in here, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Look at my skin leak. And I just got out here. He liked my new handkerchief. I'm using real ones. That darn laundry ruined all my Kleenex. Oh. Oh. Yeah, don't forget we're having a meeting tomorrow night, too. Could I have a glass of water? I'll come and get it! <laughs> it's okay. That's fine. You're a wonderful fellow, Neil. You're a nice kid. 
and you're good to your folks. You never go home. <laughs> you ever see little kids drink water? <laughs> That's good. You know, this is a prosperous part of the world. I hear the Tim's River is running three days a week now. <laughs> but um, I remember how every spring we used to go out and get old clothes and we would stuff it with straw and we would make a scarecrow for our little garden. You don't have to do that anymore. You can send off to the mail order houses for farm equipment and they have plastic scarecrows that you inflate. That's what this next little mime is about. It's the inflation, the storm, and the death of a scarecrow. seen much television since I've been in England, but um, back in the States, they, um, they have commercials that drive you nuts. The only thing you can't do, I was thinking about, was uh, what if you could sell hard liquors? Now the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, say that you cannot sell anything on radio or television that contains more than 26 percent by volume of alcohol. But you can sell beer and wine, but you can't use it. <laughs> so I like to try and show what might happen if they could sell real hard liquors on television and the announcers had to use this stuff instead of just saying, try this, try that. <laughs> I'll be right back. There we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want you to ask me for a raise. You ain't gonna get it. Uh, the, uh... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely evening, isn't it? Bring the children close to the television because this is the Guzzler's Gin program. Have you tried Guzzler's? It comes in two sizes, the collie size and the jumbo elephant size. With Guzzler's, there's no bad taste, no after effects, no upsetting the nerves, just a nice, smooth drink. Pour it on your glass and it... <laughs> Pour a little... <laughs> He's got saran wrap on this thing. <laughs> You're proud of that, ain't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pour a little in your glass and drink it right down. But be sure and ask for Guzzler's Gin, a nice, smooth drink. <laughs> drink a little after dinner. Drink some before, you won't have to eat any dinner. 
I'll be back in a moment with more from our sponsors. In the meantime, here's our guest star of the evening, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ritt. Huh? Why, this is ridiculous. I didn't get a, come over here because I knew of Howard Hughes. Hey, there's, a, there, there's an amazing story for you. You talk about me being nuts and stuff. Howard Hughes, there's a case for you. Are you ready? Here's Howard Hughes, a man that no one ever seen. The knee was missing. <laughs> then when they found him, he was gone. <laughs> then they weren't sure it was him. <laughs> now they're fighting over his personal handwritten will. He didn't write. <laughs> and they're trying to collect money they ain't gonna get. <laughs> Our guest star of the evening, J. Newton Numskull, Doctor of Poetry. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. My first poem. Put 15 cents on number four. Uh, yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> my first poem. I asked my girl if me she'd wed. With a smile in her roguish eye, she said, Go ask father. Now she knew that I knew that her father was dead. She knew that I knew of the life he had led. So she knew that I knew what she meant when she said, Go ask father. And now back to our announcer and more from our sponsors, Guzzler's Gym. <laughs> this is a Guzzler's Gym program you're looking at. Are you trying Guzzler's It comes in two sizes. Get the college size tonight. One bottle, you're in a class for yourself. <laughs> because there's no bad taste, no after effects, no upsetting the nerves, just a nice, smooth drink. Pour a little in your glass. Pour a little in your glass. Pour a little in your glass. Well, there goes my nails. Pour a little in your glass and drink it right down. But be sure and ask for color gin. A nice mood gin. <laughs> oh, why can't I get an oatmeal program? <laughs> Brother. <laughs> well, get me wrong, it's really good stuff, see. <laughs> when I smell it, it makes my mouth water and I don't like it diluted. You see? <laughs> and I think. That's mighty dry gin, you know that? Yeah. <laughs> it comes in five, uh, two sizes, two sizes. A bank our guest star, more from my sponsors, got gin. Take it away, Snooty. I don't feel too good. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, you drunken bum, you. <laughs> My next poem, too soon. Too soon. Thank you. <laughs> you, you. You go home, I'll lock up when I get through. <laughs> I guess they didn't hit the quota, so they're turning the lights down. <laughs> My next poem, The Prison Cell. In a prison cell, a dreary place, sat a prisoner who committed his sin. The warden said, you have one hour of grace. Is it okay, pal? Send her in. Yeah. <laughs> My next poem. It was a long last November, how well I do remember. I was one of my drunkenest primes. My heart was all a flutter as I lay down in the gutter, and a pig came up and lay down by my side. <laughs> my heart was all a flutter as I lay there in the gutter, and a woman passing by was heard to say, you can tell a man who boozes by the company that he chooses. And the pig got up and slowly walked away. <laughs> and now back to our announcer who will sign off the Guzzler's Gin program.
try guzzlers, it comes in 29 sizes. With guzzlers, you don't need a chaser. Nothing could catch you. <laughs> Pour a little in your glass. I'll get rid of it somehow. Hold on your glass and drink it like that. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> Don't get me to laughing, dear heart. You'll never get out of here. Time has expired. I got that off my insurance policy. <laughs> I sincerely hope that you had as much fun as I had. It's a lot of fun to try and make people laugh. And it's a lot of fun and reward to hear laughter without the use of four-letter words. I... Um, thank you. I, I don't condemn other comedians for what they do. I mean, I, I'm not fighting any causes. I don't, I don't dislike anybody. I, I don't hate my enemies because I made them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to thank you for inviting me here. And like I say, I hope you had fun. I personally believe that each and every one of us was put here for a purpose. And that's to build and not to destroy. If by chance someday you're not feeling well, you should remember some silly little thing that I've said or done, and it brings back a smile to your face or a chuckle to your heart, then my purpose as the clown has been fulfilled. I'll try to sum it up with a little song that I have written. <clears throat> the time has come to say goodnight. My, how time does fly. We've had a laugh. Perhaps a tear, and now we hear goodbye. I really hate to say goodnight, for times like these are few. I wish you love and happiness in everything you do. The time has come to say goodnight, and I hope I've made a friend. And so we'll say, May God bless until we meet again. Good night and may God bless. Thank you.